So that was Trenchtown. Trenchtown was a place that people just keep singing. It, it's magically, it was just a singing town. So you find that inspiration was in the atmosphere, totally. Whether you were a singer or not, you were um, involved. Yeah. Hello again, you're welcome back to another round on the Reggae Appreciation Society and today we're taking a look at Bonnie Whaler, the underrated legend. When most commentary is made about the Whalers, Bonnie Livingston is always automatically mentioned third in the pecking order after his childhood friends Peter Tosh and Bob Marley. Bonnie Whaler fully embraced his part as Reggae's spiritual ambassador, a brilliant percussionist, super gifted songwriter and elite vocalists. Bonnie never felt pressured to compete with the more front-end inclined guitar playing profiles of his bandmates and stay true to his spiritual principles to the very end. He was as gifted as Bob and as principled as Peter. Born Neville O'Reilly Livingston on April 10, 1947 in Kingston, Jamaica, when he was very young, his family moved to the village of Nine Mile in St. Anne's district. Already living in that village was a young boy called Bob Marley and both of them became close friends. They had a lot in common as they both came from single parent families. Bonnie's dad and Bob's mom started a relationship and they all moved back together to Kingston in 1952 with Bob and Bonnie practically growing up as stepbrothers in Trenchtown. The neighborhood they lived in was crawling with street gangs and rude boys and Bob's mother was a very strict lady who wouldn't let the boys mix up with all the hoodlums in the neighborhood and she largely restricted them to playing in the front yard. To alleviate boredom, Bonnie and Bob passed the time by making music with homemade instruments. Around the corner lived a popular singer called Joe Higgs, who was passionate about mentoring young artists. The two lads joined forces with another teenager called Peter, who had just moved from Westmoreland to Kingston. After a few years of Joe Higgs teaching the lads musical basics like harmony and structuring, Bonnie and his teammates auditioned for Coxon Dodd, the hottest producer, in 1963. Bonnie suggested that they perform a song they had written called Simmer Down, but Bob was more interested in doing other songs. But Bonnie had his way in the end, and they performed Simmer Down for Coxon Dodd. And when Coxon Dodd heard it, he signed them immediately to his label, Coxon Records. The boys now went by the group name The Wailers, and the first single, the same song, Simmer Down, came out in December that year and went up to number one on the Jamaican singles charts. After two years of cranking out hit songs under Coxone Dodd, the Whalers were still broke, so they severed ties with their label, hoping to make it on their own. They eventually found their break in 1971, when the Whalers signed for Island Records and released their album Catch a Fire, followed by Burning, and by the time Burning was out, the Whalers were the biggest reggae band in Jamaica and were on the verge of an international breakthrough when the band began to unravel. It was 10 years since the boys had begun the journey as the Whalers and they had weathered the storms as brothers. But Chris Blackwell, the CEO of Island Records, made the business decision to push Bob Marley as the leader of the group. Bob had always been a natural leader and go-getter, but Island Records was formalizing it and it led to tensions that boiled over and Bonnie was the first to snap. After the release of Catch a Fire, the Whalers were slated for two tours to promote the album. The first was supposed to be a three-month jaunt of the UK and the second was to be in the US. In addition to the politics of the label making Bob their boss, Bonnie was not interested in touring, especially as he didn't want to venture outside Jamaica. It's not very clear why, but there have been several theories as to why Bonnie wasn't interested in leaving Jamaica. The first was Bonnie's strong devotion to his Rastafarian principles, which put him off performing in places he perceived as Babylon, namely the UK and the US. And the second theory, which I find more tenable, is that he was just scared of flying. Bonnie managed to go along with the UK leg of the tour. After the band returned to Jamaica, he refused to go along for the US leg and passively began to ease himself out of the band. Not long after, Peter Tosh and Bob Marley came to blues. During one of their shows, Peter quit the band immediately effectively bringing the Whalers to an end. Now a solo artist, Bonnie adopted the stage name Bonnie Whaler in tribute to his starting point and founded his own label, Solomonic Records. And in that year, he released his first single, Searching for Love. The following year, he released four more singles that caught the attention of Island Records again. 
He still had a working relationship with Island Records. So Chris Blackwell gave him $40,000 to record two solo albums. Bunny used the money to buy a huge estate a few miles outside Kingston, which he named Dreamland, and went to work on two albums for Island Records as agreed. His debut solo album, Black Heart Man, was released in 1976 and is a phenomenal body of music that is regarded as one of the greatest roots reggae albums of all time. An extraordinary collection of songs that was typical of Bonnie Whaler, complex and brilliantly delivered in a tone that was moderate but heavy in political and spiritual content. It quickly established Bonnie as a highly original and visionary singer and songwriter. His second album for Island Records was 1977's Protest. Though it's been rated a notch lower than Black Heart Man, it was also an exceptional release with squatting performances from Bonnie, where he gave some of his sweetest vocal performances. In many ways, Bonnie had the most distinct vocal style. His voice was always dreamier, more meditative and more soulful than Bob and Peter's, as both men's voices carry an edgier, more agitated and passionate slant. Bonnie's stage performances were also hypnotic and charming as you can get. As energetic as Bob and Peter's live shows, but done with impeccable dance moves that entrance his audience like puppets on a string. He went on to release a slew of brilliant albums that were all successful, commercially and critically, while staying faithful to his Rasta faith and his self-imposed abstinence from touring overseas. But in 1986, he broke with tradition and finally undertook his first tour outside Jamaica. This was to promote his album, Roots Man Skanking. The tour was a roaring success, exemplified by his now legendary performance at Madison Square Garden, which was packed full of fans, itching to see him perform for more than 10 years. Like a lion freed from his cage, Bunny gave a ferocious performance, the high point when he sang Cool Runnings, which is one of the most popular songs of the Roots Man Skanking album. He kept releasing amazing music and won the Grammy for Best Reggae Album three times. First in 1991 for Time Will Tell, second in 1995 for Critical, and the third in 1997 for Hall of Fame. He released 27 albums in a prolific and productive career, the last being 2013's Reincarnated Souls, which was among a great number released on the Solomonic record label. Since his departure from the Whalers in 1973, his pattern of life remained unchanged a meditative, spiritual man. He was content to live a reserved life, spending most of his time enjoying nature on the huge estate he had bought with the money Island Records had paid him back in 74. There he communed with nature, grew corn and enjoyed his herbs. He was awarded the Order of Jamaica in 2012 and the Boniwela Museum was opened in Kingston in 2017. He lived much longer than his bandmates but tragedy came towards the end when his wife Jean Watts, who was suffering from dementia, disappeared from their home. He suffered two strokes due to the sad event and passed away on 2nd of March 2021. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe, and until next time, Jabless. bless.